just the goodness of God. Yeah. <clears throat> I was lying in bed one morning and I had, had a real rough night sleeping. Well, no, well, not sleeping actually. And, um, you know, when those things happen, I, I'm constantly like, Lord, what is it? Lord, what is it? Lord, what is it? Because he speaks at the, for me anyway, in the oddest places and in the oddest times. And um, I was thinking about issues in the family and issues, you know, all over. And, and I just felt the Lord settle me down and, and as real as if I could hear an audible voice. He said to me, I want them. I want them. You know, I was thinking of all the issues in my head, you know, with my family and children and church and all of those things. And, and the Lord said, I died because I wanted them. I wanted them. And when we sing that song, the goodness of the Lord chases after me. In fact, that was the song that just flowed in my heart after I heard that. I woke my husband up. I said, the Lord wants us. Not now. <laughs> he was like, what are you talking about? He wants us. Do you understand? He wants us. He wanted us. You know, he looked over humanity, you know, and he picked a time and a place where the revelation of Jesus Christ touched our hearts. And we said, yes, Lord. I mean, how awesome is that? He really wants you. He wants you. He wanted you. And he was willing to let his son die. You know, we know that in our heads. But when it reaches our hearts, it's like nothing else matters. Nothing else counts. Nothing else is secure. It's just the love that God has towards us and that he wanted us and provided a way that we not only could walk with him on this earth, in this dark, dark place that's growing darker, we can walk with peace, we can walk in love, we can love our enemies, we can, you know, we can have a confidence when there's nothing around us that will, that will demonstrate that, because he loves us, and he wants us. He wants to spend time with us. He wants to empower us. He wants to gift us. He wants us to do mighty exploits in the earth. And that's different for all of us. But he wants us. You know, if you're struggling in your heart with the love of God, which passes all understanding, which knows no bounds, it has no criteria, you know, I love my husband with all my heart, but I still kind of set up boundaries and, and, you know, not meaning to, of course. But, you know, and, and, and we look at each other, well, they really love us. They would love us. Yeah, you know, well, we're frail and we're weak, but God's love is perfect all the time. It never wavers. It never diminishes. Actually, it gets clearer and brighter and stronger. Right? Look, I don't know what, I know everybody's got issues and issues and problems and things that torment us and whatever, but when you can begin to rest in the arms of the Lord, in the love of Christ. Look, I don't know why some people get healed and some don't, and why this happens and why that happens, but I know he loves me. I know he loves me. And fortunately for me, I had a, I had a earthly father that was magnanimous. I mean, I never doubted his love or his confidence in me or, you know, I was spoiled. You know, I know a father's love. But I know the father's love. Rest in that. I know sometimes these battles just rage all around us and, and, and issues, but rest. Put yourself away. It's okay. You're not, you're not tuning out. Actually, you're going, you're finding your source of strength. He loves you. He loves you and he wants you. He wants your fellowship. He wants your 
your devotion. He wants your praise. He wants to be glorified on the earth, and we're the only ones that can do that. That's our commission. That's our mission. Glorify the Lord. He'll work out everything else. Amen. 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 And even those instances, even in those times when God or your spouse wakes you up <laughs> in the middle of the night and it was so hard to get to sleep, I'm reminded of the scripture. Oh, Lord. He that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. He's up all the time. He just wants company. Think about that. Um, I so appreciate the um, prophetic ocean that was released um, this morning. And it um, encouraged me um, to bring a word. Now, how many of you felt that the word that you heard this morning from the front of the room or the back of the room? How many felt it was for you or it spoke to you? Amen. Okay. The word isn't always for everybody all over the place. But a word comes to bring comfort, exhortation, encouragement, instruction. Some of us didn't need, but we already knew that. But others needed to be reminded. And I waited until now, um, not wanting to just piggyback on somebody else's word. Because, listen, I, I've been in situations where the anointing has been so heavy. Um, many years ago at a, at a men's conference at the 700 Club, we were in the dining hall, and somebody began to prophesy. And the anointing was so strong, the bus boys could have prophesied. You didn't need a prophetic anointing. You didn't need a, a, an office. You didn't need to be told you had a gift. I mean, it, the word of God just welled up in that place. Yes, Lord. And it, it's amazing. He's all around us. All around us. And yet we look, you know, oh, i got to go to the mountaintop. Oh, i got to go here. No. He's right, he's right there. And I believe what he said to me, and I, I don't think he just said it to me, um, but I, I'll share it with you because I, I think it's for all of us. It's in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22 and verse 31. Jesus is speaking, and he says to Peter, well, I'll give you the bad news first. Then the good news. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Anybody feel like they've been through the mill lately? The grist mill? That, you know, you just finally get a head over here, you get this all organized and settled, and boom, 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 four other things pop up to, to pull you away, to almost, almost take you like that Thanksgiving turkey wishbone, you know, and want to split you in two different directions. I, I believe God is speaking to each of us in this hour. Behold, Satan has demanded, oh, he's got some nerve, has demanded permission to sift you as we. The good news is he has to get permission. Amen. So, nothing ever surprises the Lord. It may surprise us, but it doesn't surprise him. And, and if you're going through something, it's only because God has given permission for it. But before he gave permission, he made sure you were equipped, that you were prepared to face it. 
you know, Jesus never promised us a rose garden, eh? that we would just skip merrily through life unaffected with that guard all plastic shield around us that nothing could affect us. How many know life hurts? Okay. And, and diagnoses hurt. And news hurts. And situations unfold or develop. And they hurt. But many, many years ago at Church of Praise, uh, the most prophetic thing I ever heard was from like a five-year-old. And she just stood up and said, Jesus heals all my boo-boos. That, that's got to be a faith builder. That's got to let you know somebody's in charge here. Somebody's watching. Somebody cares. Somebody's got your back. But this continues. And I want you to think about this. The good news that Jesus says, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And he speaks directly to Peter and you. When once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Once you have turned again? I wonder how many of us, and this is an individual thing between you and God, and I know it's for me and, and my Lord. What do you mean once I have turned again? Have we got caught up in a sloppy agape? Have we found ourselves, you know, just kind of kicking back? Hey, I've done this for 20 years. I've done this for 30 years. Let somebody else do it. I, I had my turn. Your turn doesn't end until you stand before him and cast your crown at his feet. That's when our turn ends. That's when we're released from the call of God and the responsibilities of a walk with Almighty God. I wonder how many of us have been caught up and just thinking, well, I'm a Christian. I love God. I don't, I don't do that anymore. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't whatever, you know, whatever the thing was that God set you free of. He didn't just set you free so he could set you on a shelf. And you could be a token, or you could be a, a trophy. He saved us and equipped us so that we might touch others. Think about the last time you had an opportunity to share. Not, not, not with a, a good old brother or a sweet, sweet sister. It's so easy in church to be a Christian. Not so easy when the light turned and they haven't gone. <laughs> or the lady in front of you is counting out her change at, 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 at the supermarket at the cashier and telling the young man how helpful he's been. And is that a quarter, honey, or is it a dime? You know, <clears throat> you know. Lady, you know what express means? <laughs> we, in everyday situations, we, we find ourselves. But I, I think this is what God really wants us to, to consider. Once you have turned again, is it time to turn, saints? Is it time to wake up, light up, look in the mirror and say, hey, Am, am I really who God has called? Am, 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 am I the one he's, he's talking to? What does he mean when you turn again? Obviously, we've made a wrong turn. Peter, right after that, he swore up and down. Look, I, not, not me. I, I take this to the grave. Man, I go to jail, whatever. And Jesus' response. Whatever. Whatever. When's the last time you heard a rooster, Peter? Because you're going to hear it again. Is it time for us to turn? I wonder. Do we, we you know, well, we don't wait for January 1st for a New Year's resolution. 
surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And surely he's saying to us, come up higher. I have so much more for you. Don't stay down there. But put a little feet to your faith. Step out. Take a chance. What's the worst that's going to happen? Somebody's going to laugh at you or mock you. Somebody's going to dismiss you. Oh, you're one of those. I'm glad to be one of those. You know, because there was a time when nobody wanted me. But he did. It took me a long time to find that out. That's, that's just a, a, an exhortation. And now I know you'd like benediction, but we don't have that today. So we'll just see what the Lord has to say. Um, I, I, uh, I come humbly this morning having absolutely no idea what I'm supposed to do because last week we looked at Peter's resume. And, and I spoke to you about, you know, all the things, Peter, in his impetuousness, all the stuff he did, some of it was really good, and it's, and the good and the bad has been recorded, okay, it's here, we can see, if we know nothing else about the guy, we know he was real, you know, his middle name was, oops, <laughs> you know, it's, it's amazing how we find ourselves in the people that we meet in the Bible. You know, with all our advances and all of our um, uh, uh, developments and, and, and all, all the things that, that we have that they never had at our disposal, um, we still aren't all that much different from those who, who preceded us. And we were in good company with those who, who sought the Lord. Um, I was going to um, really continue with Peter today, and I'm excited about that because in, in, the, in, in the Friday Bible study at, at the village, we we're in the book of Acts, and Peter commands the first 12 chapters of the, of the book of Acts. So all about him, and everything he says and does, it just is magnanimous. It just is phenomenal. And is that the same guy, you know? You wonder, are we the same? If you're the same person that Jesus saved X number of months or years ago, you got a problem. You got a problem because you turn. And when you turn again, instruct your brethren. We, we were saved to help others. We were saved to get this good news out. Um, and, and, and I, I'm stuck in that track, aren't I? Um, my Lord. Well, the message that I had, um, as we begin this new month, the message that I, I thought was so, so vital and so important, um, is, is where I'm going to go with, because that's kind of what God gave me, and I, I'm not sure I know why. I don't ever know why. You'll know why. If it speaks to you, you'll know why. If it doesn't, you say, why did I come here today? You know, one, one or the other. Um, but every channel you flip now that uh, the hurricane's gone is about, oh, what seems to be on the mind of Americans? What seems to be motivating us? What's the biggie? Well, it's always going to be on pocketbook, you know. It, it's just the times in which we live and the multiple resources at our disposal. You know, everybody knows costs have gone up. Everybody knows packages have gotten smaller. Um, everybody knows you're getting less for your dollar. Um, so we all talk about it. Just like the weather. Okay? Climate change. We know all about it. Haven't been able to do a blessed thing. Right? Can't, can't, you can't. Yeah. What are you going to stand out there with, a, with one of those spinning things and say, ha ha, I got you. you know? That's not going to work. The biggest item 
it seems to be on everybody's mind. It's the cost of everything. Inflation or the economy or, or whatever label you want to put on it. But we're not going to do much about that. Some of the things we can do something about. And one of them, and I, and I felt the Lord put this on my heart, is um, to talk to you about abortion. We, we've never really discussed it from the pulpit. Oh, we have our little conversations. Well, just do right, you know? Where do you stand? Um, well, if you've never been involved in one, you can take a righteous stand. You've never been impacted or affected by it. But if perhaps you have, it might be a painful topic or a painful subject to, uh, to play with. Um, you know, I, I don't want to point my finger at, at anybody, but let me tell you, my sin always looks worse on you. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not so quick to admit what's wrong with me, but boy, I could see it on you in a heartbeat. Now, what's the matter with them? Why don't they straighten up? You know, why don't they do this or that? God didn't call us to that. But he did give us all of this word. And um, I, I really think it's an issue that the church needs to address. Are we going to, you know, is this group going to change that? I, I, I don't know. But, but the change comes in people's hearts and, and one at a time. And the people we impact and affect by our decision. But to just tell somebody, well, I'm a Christian, we don't believe in that. Well, that, that's a flat line. Um, do you know why you support some things and why you oppose others? You, you, need, you need to know, you need to have a reason. Um, <clears throat> and many of us make it up. But God doesn't like that. Or God didn't say that, you know. Um, or, or my church teaches. Well, what does the Word of God say? And where do we stand? So let's begin this morning. I, I think I can get through this in, in not too many minutes. And, and, and with a conclusion that I only thought I might be able to uh, present during worship. God speaks to us in worship. He really does. And, and you know what? Three people could be sitting next to each other, and each one of them gets something different because you can't exhaust God. And he knows right where you are, and he knows just how to touch your heart. He knows how to heal it. He knows how to fix it. He knows how to speak to it. And so in, in the book of Exodus, and, and we're summing up Genesis, and, and I, I, again, some of the characters in the Bible, I guess we all have favorite characters, right? And we may have several. But some people really impress us. And you say, I, I, I don't know if I could have done what they did. I don't know. You know, ladies, how many of you would like to have been an Esther? Well, you all are because you start out beautiful. Okay? <laughs> so, but how many of you would have pressed in and been able to, to fulfill that, that call. I mean, she's an impressive lady. Mary, called to be the mother of Jesus. Wow. Wow. And she paid a price. Her heart was ripped and broken and torn and pierced. Um, so many. Um, but uh, let, me, let me just stay with one young man. Actually, there's only three people I'm really going to talk about this morning. The first is Joseph. Joseph, a man of dreams. And I think we're going to see a, a, quite a bit about dreams, um, if I can get this all together. Um, Joseph, his dad, he was daddy's favorite. And he had some dreams. But he was young and immature. So what did he do? He blamed. And, and what did it do? Took him behind the woodshed. His brothers weren't thrilled with his dreams, you know. Um, oh, sure, your daddy's favorite. You got that coat? No matter where you go, we'll find you. We can see you in that, that rainbow thing you're wearing. And how they sold their brother into slavery and so forth, but how God had a plan for him. And all of his setbacks, 
You know, I'd like to wind up like Joseph. I just didn't want to take that boot. You know, I didn't want to go to jail. And I, 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 didn't, I don't want all those things to happen. I want to be accused of, of, of what Mrs. Potiphar said about me. But we find that at the end of Exodus, um, his brothers are come to him, realizing he's identified himself and they're getting everything. Oh, yeah, that's the end of Genesis. Yes, thank you, Ed. Um, 19. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid, for am I in God's place? I'm not going to retaliate. I'm not, I, I, listen, I've dismissed what you guys did. I've been too busy obeying God and, and carrying out his assignment. Then I have absolutely no animosity towards you. And he says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. He, he had a higher calling, and he, and he walked in it. We drop down. Now um, we go into, um, into Exodus. And verse 6 tells us, Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. We move right along. They're gone. It's a record of, of what, what transpired, but they're gone. But the sons of Israel were, were fruitful, and increased greatly, and multiplied, and became exceedingly mighty, so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. We got a problem. You know, the servants are bigger than the family. They could take over the house. That's just a, an illustration. What was happening, the Hebrew children were growing strong in their slavery. They were growing strong in the work that they did. The men were strong, the women were strong, everybody worked in the fields. The women were, were, were birthing children left, right, and sideways, because they had no time. They didn't have a maternity ward. They didn't have a, a recovery room. They delivered their children in the fields, nursed them, got up, and kept doing whatever they were doing. Um, you know, all right, I, I accelerated that. But that must have been the way it was happening. And they were a strong people. And so the king is getting concerned. He says, you know, they could easily displace us. And, and the Egyptians compelled, uh, in verse 13 of Exodus 1, the Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously. And they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field. All the labors which they rigorously imposed upon them. Just keep working harder and longer. And the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other was named Pua. And he said, when you're helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall put him to death. Wow. Right at birth. As soon as you deliver, kill him. Gee. That sound familiar? Wow, we're civilized. We would never, never do anything like that. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They were Hebrew women. And we, we have to go all the way to the New Testament to Acts when, when Peter is before the council and they say, don't teach you that name anymore. He says, listen, you guys decide whether we should obey you or God. You know, well, these Hebrew uh, midwives, they already had made that conclusion. The midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded him, but let the boys live. And so the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said, Why have you done this thing and let the boys live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. Plausible story. Yeah, there's so many of them, and, and there's only two of us, and, you know, by the time we get to them, they've already delivered the babies and they're gone, you know, and, and, and I think he bought it. 
Um, so God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. Because the midwives feared God, he established households for them. You do right, and God does right by you. It's just, it's a principle. It just works. Um, and Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born, you, you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. And then we're told about um, the birth of a boy uh, whose mom puts him in a basket. She hides him for three months. Um, I'm accelerating here. Um, and um, has her daughter, his, his sister, watch the, the basket. And Pharaoh's daughter comes down to bathe in, in the Nile. And, and the basket's there in the weeds. She has one of her one of her maidens gets the basket. She sees an a, a adorable little baby, um, a boy, and uh, she says, we'll take care of him. And she raises him as her son. Meanwhile, the sister also says um, to Pharaoh's daughter, listen, I can get one of, the, um, one of the Hebrew women to nurse this baby boy. She says, okay, I'll pay her. So Moses' mother gets to nurse him, gets paid in the process, and uh, uh, um, Moses comes along. Um, and so she names him Moses because he was taken out of the water. But we look at, at verse 23. Um, it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and they cried for help, because of their bondage, rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What happened? Why, why do we want to kill babies? Because they were a threat. They, they could, we've lost sight of the fact um, exponentially that the more people there are, the bigger families grow, the better they're able to care one for another. And, and um, you know, look, you, you look at, at some of the reruns of the old, the old shows. What happens? Mom and pop get old, turn the farm over to the kids. They, they move into a little part of the house, and the kids take over the house, and they run the farm. And then they have kids, and the farm gets bigger, and they buy more land. And, Everybody is able to care one for another, and it, and it grows, and it's, it's God's um, multiplication, but every life is precious, and we find out, if, if we stay in chapter 3, that um, um, Moses has to be feed, because he grows up in Pharaoh's house, but he knows he's Jewish, and what happens? One day, one day he sees an Egyptian soldier beating um, one of the slaves. He goes over and he just kills the guy. You know, and just, that's it. And buries him in the sand. And figures, well, that's the end of that. Next day, he finds two Jews fighting. Now, how's he going to pick one? He said, what's the matter with you two? They said, who made you a horse over us? What, are you going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? Moses said, I'm out of here. You know, I, I can't hang around here. I've got a reputation already. And he, and, and he goes and he, uh, he finds himself on the back side of the desert, tending sheep for his father-in-law. Then what happens? A bush talks to him. And, and the rest we know is history. Okay. I wanted to also tell you about... Um, uh, the, 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 all of the elements surrounding Jesus' birth, how Herod was killing children. He's trying to find this king of the Jews that was born, and all kinds of things happen. You can read about it in, in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 1. But the scripture is full of God wanting to give life. And every life has a purpose, and every life is important. Now, we, you know, Jesus, of course, um, Joseph uh, is led by the Lord. He followed, uh, follows those instructions and uh, keeps Mary safe. And Jesus is born and, 
and the major I don't go back and tell Herod, they go home another way. So Herod kills every child two years old and under, wipes out a whole next generation. And we've come along, here we are, in our advanced intelligence and all the modern conveniences, and abortion started. How sad. It was meant to control a people of color. Amen. And that, that's a known fact. That's not a secret. It was then. But the secret's out. Oh, so now some of us are better than others. Really? I don't know. Not if we're all created in the image and likeness of God. Boy, are we going to be surprised one day. And what happened? What happened? And that, that's supposed to be um, uh, under the guise of a woman's choice. Whether it's a man's choice or a woman's choice or a boy or a girl's choice or a grandparent's choice. You do not have absolute authority over your own life. You didn't give yourself life and you can't take life. There are, there are conditions in the Bible where we can defend ourselves. The Second Amendment in this nation allows us to bear arms to defend ourselves, but not to go on the offensive against our neighbors. That was never the intent of the law. You know, this abortion is now presented as a woman's right. I want to tell you, those lawmakers no more care about women than the man in the moon. Amen. Right. Abortion is about votes, as, as are so many issues. Vote your pocketbook. You know, um, all, 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 of, all of those seniors, uh, 65 and up, you want to vote for the candidate who's going to increase Social Security. That's selfish. Is, is, it, is that really going to make a difference in your lifestyle if you get seven dollars more a month? Well, you get a candy bar for seven bucks today. You know, we're we're so self-focused and so out of touch with with what God has presented. And I heard a statistic recently: if a family makes more than forty-three thousand dollars a year. A family, doesn't matter how many, okay? If you make more, make $43,000 a year or more, you are in the top 1% of the wealthy people in the world. I remember when I just wanted to make $100 a week. And, you, and you, when you achieve that goal, if I could only take home $100, that was, that was the next thing, you know? And we could buy a house making $100 a week. You could do it. You could better your family. And now the numbers are astronomical. You don't know where to put the commas anymore. You know? And, and what's, a, you know, what's a gazillion? I don't know. Um, I don't know where, where those things are. But look what's happened. And, and look, look what we're irresponsible about. Uh, I, I didn't even get to Matthew and, and, and all, but you know the details about Jesus. How many Christmases have you heard it? You know, um, but the thing is, Jesus said he came that we might have life and that we would have it more abundantly. Is abundant life about how much stuff I can jam into my garage? Is abundant life, like, um, you know, how many things I can collect, how many places I can go. No, abundant life is being at peace with God Amen. and one another. Amen. And, you know, and, and my brother has a need, and I can tell this story, I, I, I've said it before. I have never been more impressed by anything. There's, there's a, a family in our church, and um, one of their one of their children had an opportunity at, at Christmas time. He got a new coat, and wanted to know if it was okay to give the old coat to a friend who had no coat. So listen, 
That's the spirit of Christmas. Does that bless you? You know, isn't that wonderful? And then we found out two weeks later, they gave the new coat to the president, they kept the old coat. That's Christianity. That's, that's somebody who appreciates not only what they have, but, but somebody else's needs. And as we prepare for, to take communion this morning, I just want you to, to think about this. Jesus came that we might have life. Are you enjoying the fullness of the life that Jesus has for you? Are you able to share it with others? Or are you just so busy? Is life so tumultuous and has us so caught up in things? That we can't, that we just can't. Oh, Lord, I'd love to. I'd love to go to a nursing home and tell one thing. We can't, well, we can't get into the nursing home. Um, but we did. It had to be four, right, Sophia, four or five nursing homes we went to. And listen, we were never going to make a record, I promise you that. It, it, you know, I don't even know if we all sang the same words, but they loved us. They loved us and, and so appreciated. We've done... Um, have done where we had opportunity, the things that God has asked us to do. That's life. Life is, is being a blessing wherever you are. Helping somebody. And we all do it differently because we're all gifted differently. And we all have different opportunities. And, and you know what? The best, the best is what's done in secret. That, that pleases the Lord more, especially if the recipient doesn't even know it came from you. Years ago, um, times were tough, but we were managing every other week. We got a money order in the mail for $80 allowed us to go food shopping. Because we had a family of six at the time. And um, work wasn't all that plentiful. Somebody, somebody saw to it that, that, you know, we had that. I don't know where, we still pray for whoever that was um, and, and ask the Lord to, to bless them. But, you know, those are the things you remember. Now, that might have happened if we weren't Christians. But I know I appreciated it more because I was a Christian, because I knew it was God's hand that delivered it. It wasn't just somebody who felt sorry for it. He said, I came that you may have life. I want you to leave here this morning with such an appreciation of the life you have in Christ that it wells up within you that you can't help but share it and, and impart it and, and, and love others. And not just our own. We know how to be good to our own. We got to get outside that, that little circle or that little boat that we're in. Amen? Roger, if you and whoever are going to Thanks, guys. And the worship team, I, I think, is, we saved the song for such a time as this. Father, you are so good to your children. So good to us. And Lord, we're here to make a difference. We're the people who want, who want, to be known of you. We want you to be seen in us. My Okay. Thank you, Lord. Clever little things that comply and keep us from being concerned about touching the same bread that somebody else touched or whatever. Um, my Lord. My Lord. Father, I'm, I'm so thankful for the worship this morning, the prophetic utterance, the exhortation from Pastor Denise. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. And, and Lord, you make it so clear what's right and what's not. And we want to be known as people of the book. 
We want to be known that our decisions are made. We make the right decision at the right time for the right reason. And that you're behind it. You're backing us up. Jesus, we, we've got elements this morning. Simple, a little piece of cracker, a little bit of grape juice. They are elements. They continue to be elements. They don't change. Hopefully, being reminded of what this represents will change. I, I, communion is supposed to change us. It's not supposed to change. We do me no good for this to turn into something else. But then, you know, ooh, that was awesome. No, no, he's awesome. He's awesome. And Lord, you said as often as we do this, we can do it in remembrance of you. Lord, would you change us this morning? Would you make us more aware of not just the, the abundant life, but the eternal life you have promised us? We thank you. We love you. We praise you. Lord, we take this and we pray it keeps us mindful all week of the awesome sacrifice you have made on our behalf. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for one another. And you may partake. In like manner, the word tells us, he took, took the cup. After instructing his disciples and kind of saying goodbye, he said, this cup, is a new and everlasting covenant. And my blood, which is shed to you for the remission of sin. Lord, we are forgiven. We may be a forgetful people, but keep us mindful we are a forgiven people because of what Jesus did. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father.